Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, the zebra effect. Round number two for Grant McCaslin in the offseason as a Tech head coach. And looking ahead to scrimmage number one of Red Raider football, spring camp. Next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech. Your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Raider! Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, always free and available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. And today's episode brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? We'll take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at Nissan USA. Dot com With the only Chris Level, I'm Casey Cowan. Chris, great to be back with you once again. Wrapping up the week as we are rolling into an Easter weekend and a few things to consider in today's conversation. We will get to Joey McGuire and the Red Raider football team spring camp ongoing today featuring scrimmage number one. And I want to get to a conversation that uh, does involve something that we've touched on before, which is essentially a whole lot of opportunity in the running backs room during this spring camp, given the fact that your number one guy is uh, proven, vetted, and verified, obviously not having to go through all of the paces necessarily to a great extent. So I want to talk about some of those other guys behind him uh, getting some opportunity to uh, cultivate that depth. And we'll hear from their position coach, Kenny Perry, coming up in just a bit. And of course, basketball on the brain as well, as we are entering offseason number Two. I guess it's number two. Maybe somebody's calling it number one for Grant McCaslin officially as a Texas Tech men's basketball coach. But, you know, you go back to uh, about this time last year, Chris, and it was kind of uh, a frenzy as far as what the future of the program was going to look like. Then you wind up making the hire. Coach McCaslin is your guy. And then it was another frenzy setting in as you attempted to build a staff, attempted to build a roster. You know, I'm not here to say that or suggest that his uh, feet are up on the desk and he's just kicked back, taking it easy now. But there's got to be, I guess, more of a sense of calm, you would think, this time around, even though he does need to fill an assistant coaching spot now. Uh, Some things in place and some culture established and obviously some things to build on. So curious to see how this experience is going to go for him this time. Yeah, he was, uh, I guess he was officially announced, depending on when you listen to this or watch this podcast, you know, March 31st a year ago. So depending on when you, you watch or see this, it's it's really close to just one year. And I just think about how much was an unknown at the time that he took over last year. You know, he when he got here, he brought Matt Breyer, uh, Coach AC, uh, Coach Wright, the strength coach, uh, Coach Wilson, who was a player development guy. Uh, you know, and he, so he had some pieces initially, and then there was some some other, and, and nobody really at the time you can weren't sure what whose role, uh, you know what what roles these guys were going to have, and, and things like that. Compl- roster a complete unknown, a complete like we we know zero. We know all these guys that were on the team. Again, do they want to stay? Do we want them to stay? I mean, all all the things that we have kind of talked about. And if you fast forward, because, um, you know, th- this is going to be a, a hot topic for the next, I don't know, several weeks or months, uh, depending on how long it takes to kind of put put things together. And But they've got some time now and, and all those things. But how much easier is it for Grant now? And, and I've talked to him about this uh, throughout the season, just how much is in place now that they can, one, you've gone through the league you know, you know, kind of what you need or how it's going to be or what you were deficient in. We've, we've, we've talked about the size and, and just depth piece uh, ad nauseum. But, you know, how much more structure you have in place now that you can go about your offseason. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and, and, and here's, the, here's the most important thing. I think for, for a coach – it, it's not who can I trust in town, who can I trust uh, amongst the, the, the donor or administratively or whatever. But now I've got like culture. I, I, th- there's players on my team that I think I'm going to have back. I think that, that that's a foregone conclusion with, with a, a really solid nucleus. They now know what we expect 
And those kids know what to expect from coaching staff. This is how we do things. This is how we're about or what we're about. This is individually what you need to work on. And all, all those things, those are all in place. But I just think about how drastic of a difference it is. Year ones are tough, man. And that's why we'll forget about that years from now, about how good of a year that they had because it was year one. I mean, so much of this was new. All of it. Yeah. Staff chemistry, player chemistry, scheme, culture, all that stuff. I mean, you're, everybody's learning together, and it's kind of put together fairly quickly. And then out comes this unbelievable product that finished fourth in the Big 12 that uh, that made it to the NCAA tournament. And so you, you fast forward and like, okay, now how much easier – I don't want to say the right – that maybe not the right word is easy, but how much – better or or i guess that's maybe it is the right word um, <laughs> that's the way i to, feel like i don't yeah. want to act like oh it's all good now no worries it's still <laughs> yeah. a challenge right <laughs> yeah it, it is it is <laughs> but at least you know how to attack it and at least you've got a backbone at least you've got some things you can lean on um and, yeah. and a nucleus that i know i've coached them i know what they that we know each other and all those things but i've got so many of my people around me that can help you know, we can kind of maneuver this, you know, together uh, through through this offseason with roster stuff and and just, you know, scheduling. And because that's the other thing, Callan, I, I think people forget you take over a year ago, your your schedule was far from undone. People kind of poked it, looked at your 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 non-conference schedule. They kind of showed up and were like, um, OK, we, we need to figure some things out and and quickly. And then you've got budget that factors into that available dates in your arena and all those things. So now you're, you're in a better place there too, which I think a lot of people don't think about. They just, the basketball scheduling is not like football scheduling. It's year to year and it, there's a budget that comes with it and that there's available dates on an arena. Uh, and so with your girls team and then graduation, and then like, we don't want to play back to back night and there's all the, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a formula. So it's a bit tricky. So I just think that uh, this off season will be, much more palatable and probably they can all take a deep breath of sorts uh, as it relates to kind of putting things together. And now that they've done a lot of the the legwork from last year. Well, and you know, from a personnel standpoint, uh, I, I'm really excited to see what he can go out and get. He, along with his staff because of the success and the hit rate on the guys that they brought in again during a frenzied kind of time uh, a year ago, let's stick with basketball, but let's pivot around to the men with whistles. First, today's episode brought to you by Manscaped, the spring cleaning champions. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer, go to manscaped.com and use our code locked on for 20% off plus free shipping. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. There's nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants with Manscaped. Today's episode brought to you by Better Together. Daily Fantasy Sports players, listen up. Are you tired of the same old Daily Fantasy grind? Make a roster, cross your fingers, hope for the best, all alone. Well, Better Together is here to shake it up as the first cooperative Daily Fantasy platform where teamwork makes the dream work. Got a friend who's a fantasy shark? Play with him, not against him. Use him to your advantage. It's a great way to stay connected with your sports crew when gone are the days of watching games together when, you know, work, marriage, newborns get in the way. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with the bros to boost your odds, and watch yourselves climb up the leaderboard together like Rocky and Apollo. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using our promo code Locked On for a free $5 entry into any NCAA basketball contest. Remember the code Locked On. On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. Let's pivot around to the men with whistles, Chris, because <laughs> we now have 
some some time spent in the NCAA tournament. We had another Big 12 team bounced uh, last night in Iowa State. I'm so glad. I'm so glad Terrence Shannon went went to Illinois. It was so <laughs> important that we got him out of here. What a terrific move. Um, shout out to TJ for an incredible game. Another one. Um, but I was curious as to your take on what you have seen so far from Big 12 teams in the tournament and comparing and contrasting you know, some of what we saw in the regular season, the officiating that they were accustomed to, has it been impactful, you think, as far as a change or some dramatic shift whenever you get into the postseason? Was it much ado about nothing? Because we did talk about it and consider whether or not you would see, you know, that impact teams from the Big 12 Conference. And, and maybe it was overblown. I don't know. But what have you seen from your perspective? I think the way that I think it's probably hurt some Big 12 teams um, in general with the way that they played most of the year compared to how they're playing in the NCAA tournament, the way that get these games are called, if that's kind of what you're asking. Yeah. You've got, as you and I sit here and talk, you've got one team left. That's the University of Houston. They will play on a Friday night versus Duke in Dallas. Uh, they, they barely survived last weekend because of this very subject. Um a lot of foul trouble, guys fouling out. You're finishing with walk-ons on the floor at the end of the game, having to shoot crucial free throws, and, and on and on it goes. And I recently heard uh, an interview with Brett Yormark that was done in Frisco, and he was asked about officiating. And th this was, you know, because th these are somewhat different but somewhat the same conversation. How do you review officiating right now in basketball? Do you wish it was? Why isn't it more transparent? Why, why are coaches reprimanded or whatever? And officials, it's like we're going to protect them and all these things. And because I do think they have to look at how this league was officiated this year. It's a great brand. It's very physical. We all knew this, but in this particular NCAA tournament, I can't say that that necessarily served you well. You know, a lot of guys injured, whether that is a reason for it or not, across the board with a lot of teams. Uh, it's called a lot tighter. Uh, I think Big 12 teams have had have struggled with that aspect just based on them losing. Not the sole reason that they've lost, sure. but I'm just I'm saying it's a contributing factor. But I thought it was interesting because your market, he talked about, you know, we're, we're looking at officiating right now. And we're looking at, you know, like because he, he mentioned the NBA model, which is he's an NBA guy. And how in the NBA they they do like the uh, two minute deal where they'll, they'll if there's a mistake made in the last two minutes the league will come out and say we screwed this up and this is who screwed it up and this is what was screwed up and it doesn't give anybody a win or a loss but it's it's transparent and he preached and preached about being wanting to be very transparent. You know, like, you know, and he mentioned uh, and the way officiating works is, too, it's, it's a bit tricky. There's a, like a consortium where the Big 12 and I think the Mountain West and I'm trying to remember if there's another league like they kind of share a group of officials. That's why you largely see the same. I think there's 55 officials. I think he said in that consortium. I think that's right. And that's the system. I mean, I don't know if that, that's a that's a bigger picture here, but. I just I think they're looking at it. I think they're going to look at the ways they can improve there. Maybe some of the coaches' complaints about you know this isn't basketball. This is you know because we had what Scott Drew, Kelvin Sampson, Bill Self all ejected within a short time frame. And I, I don't know if if you are going to look at making more officials available uh, publicly. If if you call it out when we screw it up. If you have a bigger group of officials. I don't know really what the right answer yeah. is, or is it how we are officiating our league? Do we need to adjust there? But I thought an important conversation with you have now one team left, and you're 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 whittling it down to eight teams left in the tournament as the weekend progresses, and you just at the time you and I are talking, you just have one team remaining, which I think is let's just call it what it is. That's a letdown. That's not what anybody would have thought, and I think that's not not a good look per se for the Big Twelve Conference. I, I wanted to ask you about that, and you know the results are what the results are. Um, if you're not loaded up there um, towards the end stages as the league, then uh, maybe your reputation does take a hit. You know, I guess to me, for the most part, it's it's kind of just a marketing thing. So I'm not so sure that I I really even care necessarily what the perception is. Uh, of the league, but there is something to be said, I guess, maybe selection committee wise or things like that. Like, you know, from a football perspective, 
uh, the SEC is propped up uh, by the worldwide sports leader. You know, great marketing whenever you got ESPN pushing your league, obviously. But to me, Chris, that's a little bit different than people just saying, well, this is the best basketball league or this is the toughest basketball league. So I don't know. Maybe I'm underestimating the impact of uh, a letdown like this, but I think there has been some letdown, although I, I don't know. How many were you supposed to have in there? Did you need to have like four of eight? Did you need to have two of eight? I don't know. If you wind up, say, with one in the final four uh, or a national champion coming from your league, was it that much of a letdown? I, I don't know. I'd love to hear from the audience in the YouTube comments what they think about that part of it because uh, I kind of think the expectations maybe were all over the place as far as how we define you know, what was going to be success for the Big 12 Conference. Maybe you wanted more further into the tournament, even if it wasn't like a big share of the Elite Eight or whatever eventually. Um, but I, I don't know. I think the we're talking about one game uh, as far as, you know, winning or losing. And uh, it can always be your night or not be your night. But the whole, I don't blame the Big 12 for running with it. We're the best league in the country. Obviously, I don't blame them for running with it. Uh, but I'm not sure, like, tangible impact do you really think there is something to lose if you kind of have a, a hit on that perception? Did you really gain something if you didn't have a hit on that perception? How do you really think it shows up like tangibly if it does at all? So you and I may have a different perspective than like the commissioner does. Okay. The, the one that's pushing this, this narrative and this brand and this yeah. image and all those things. And it, it, it does affect your finances. Some may not care about that. And, and we're talking the league finances, you know, because the That's more true. teams you have advanced, the more money the league gets, and then the more money each school gets and all those things. I think he's coming at it from a standpoint, and he's the one that brought this up, that basically, you know, why did you get the fourth most, you know, dollars as it relates to the, the, the new CFP agreement? Well, part of the formula was, what had your football teams done over the last decade in in, in the deal? How, you know, and then yeah. and then they, there was a ratings component, uh, a participation component as far as how many teams have participated, and like the way the formula all kind of spit out was, I mean, the Big Twelve was a clear and distant fourth, and and I think that he he felt like you were happy to have that seat at the table, and he understood the the rationale. He also points out that he would like to look at the way that the money is distributed with the NCAA tournament. And if you earn more, if you create more for this tournament with your league, you should get more. Yeah. And I think that he would probably say, if I'm going to make that argument and I feel like we should squeeze more out of this deal, it doesn't help us when we only have one team left in the you know, left at the time that you and I are talking. Right. Because that's because <laughs> his task is to generate as much revenue as possible. That's that's his sole focus. And and it does probably hurt the perception of it. I've seen you, you're gonna hear about it a lot, you know, a year from now when we get into February and March, and it doesn't matter how the net shows and Guys, look at the net. Didn't really matter. Everybody dogged the ACC. They got four teams in the Sweet 16. The Big 12 had two. I mean, yeah. what, whether that is really what makes decisions, you know, when the committee sits down and puts pen to paper, I don't know. Uh, but I think that you're, if you're looking at it from a brand or a finances standpoint, it, it, you, you take a hit. Yeah. Um, and and again, tangible, well, you and I don't ever see this money. I mean, we, we don't. It, it's just a... Uh, you can argue with your buddies at the water cooler about uh, <laughs> yeah. your league being better than their league and all that stuff. So, um, but I think that's where he's coming at it from. And I think that's important gotcha. to know. Gotcha. Okay. Let us know what you guys think there in the uh, YouTube comments. Let's leave basketball there for the time being and finish up on a football front. First, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that's standing out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. Today, again, at our expense, the NC State Wolfpack goes the way of the Nissan Rogue, continuing their surprise run now into the Sweet 16. They say, win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Wolfpack continue to to do take the nissan rogue nissan pathfinder or nissan armada and go find your next big adventure shop nissanusa.com today 
scrimmage number one is on the way today. Today being Friday, depending upon when you're listening to this, may have already happened. But obviously one thing that's uh, really intriguing about this spring camp, and we've talked about it before, I alluded to it a moment ago, is what's happening with your collection of running backs. You've got one of the best in the nation to lead that group, and then we want depth behind it. Do we have any depth behind it? I think there is a big question mark, even though a guy like Cameron Valdez, we did see make some impact here or there a season ago. You're wanting a whole lot more, uh, not only from him, but some others as well. And Texas Tech running backs coach Kenny Perry talked about just that this week. Let's take a listen to Coach Perry. One knows Taj is a valuable piece to this program and the university. Uh, great person, great leader. His leadership's been unbelievable. You know, even you know now that you come back another year, that's helped us the most. Um, <clears throat> so you know what you got in Taj, and then everybody else. You know, Cameron Valdez had some big runs last year. He played some. You know, he spelled Taj. You got to spell him a lot more. We can't, you know, put Taj through what he did last year. Um, so we got to get some of those other guys. But as far as you know, de there's not. I mean, we're moving guys in and out between Cam. You know, Valdez has been here and he's done it. And then you know, Anquan Willis. Uh, Cam Dickey and Bryson Donnell, you know, those guys are all, we're seeing who that next guy is, you know, because you got to have three running backs and realistically sometimes four uh, because those guys got to help you on special teams as well. So we're just trying to get those guys all caught up to speed. You know, we know what we got with Taj. Um, we know to an extent what Cam does. Cam's got to do some other stuff well this spring. Uh, but he's, it's not that he's not going to try. You know, he was doing that last year. He was, he's, he was basically going towards the right direction. He took the words out of my mouth there because I'm thinking you can't do <laughs> or you can't put Taj through what you put him through last year again this season. And, you know, there's some nuance to that, obviously, because he's going to have to carry a huge load if you want to be the best version uh, of yourself as a team or as an offense. Um, but there was very little to no uh, help beyond Taj Brooks last season, again, save for some Valdez impact here or there, Chris. And I mean, I can only imagine what a locker room, an opposing locker room sounds like um, the week leading up to the game or on game day when you have a guy like Taj Brooks who's so physical. The message is always going to be, let's knock the snot out of him. Let's hit him in the mouth. He's not going to out-physical us. So not only is he just taking typical ball carrier shots, I'm sure he's getting some of the best shots <laughs> that that defense is delivering because of the type of player he is. And, and you want to be able – to smack a dude like that. Now, Taj makes it very difficult to do that. Credit to Brooks for making that tough. But, uh, man, I am I, I would be somewhat concerned uh, to consider another season like last season where Taj Brooks is having to carry such a big load. I doubt Taj is, but I am a little bit. <laughs> it, 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 it's unrealistic uh, to yeah. expect um, you know him to – I mean, he had, he had nearly 300 carries last year. Cam Valdez, who was your your number two, was only available in, I think, 10 games. He carried it, I think, about 40 to 50 times. And he only netted about, uh, as I'm looking at it, yeah, about 286 yards. And I think 54 yards were on one carry. <laughs> yeah, important to note. <laughs> yeah, and, and like Nehemiah Martinez was your third running back. He had 13 carries. Uh, I think Nehemiah missed some time as well, you know, yeah. just uh, unavailable and, and and all that, and was was late to join the the, the party with the, the the season starting and all those things. But that's why, like this spring, um, it it really is important for you know we've talked uh, very favorably about Cam Dickey. Um, he he's the new guy. Um, I think uh, very talented, very well rounded, very fast, very you know he's got a frame on him. And, and all those things. And, but this is kind of a, a crucial, crucial spring or just off season in general for a guy like Cameron Valdez. Cause I mean, I think that it's kind of like a now or never, like if it doesn't happen now, like when is it going to, and it's, we've seen the flashes and it's just a really about availability. I mean, you and I were extremely high on him in August, almost as like, I'm, I'm as excited to see kind of what he can do as a compliment and and maybe as a change up as much as anything else on the team. This was one of the things you and I talked about last August is like either players or just storylines that we were looking forward to. And we did not envision in any way the kind of year that Taj Brooks was going to have. Nobody did. And, and they kind of morphed and changed who they were. But I just go back to you've got to this spring is crucial for the list of guys that you just heard about. Anquan Willis, more of a short yardage bruiser type. 
Uh, Bryson Donnell has been here. I think that, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting for those guys too because you, you've got guys like Cameron Dickey. You've got, uh, you, you know, uh, other folks that aren't here yet that are running track and doing some different things as part of the signing class that are very highly recruited that will be here in June. Um, and then Cameron Dickey, who is a high school senior basically, but he's here early. Um, uh, I, you know, so uh, I, uh, I, I just, it's going to be interesting to see kind of what shakes out there. Cause you're not going to put Taj through too much at all this spring. You don't need to, that, that, that would be, you know, he's going to be out there doing some things and all that stuff and a part of it, but we're not going to put him in harm's way. You wouldn't think, you know, I, I think is how they would, how, uh, you know, Kenny Perry and Joey and Zach Kitley would say like, we're just not going to, we're not going to do that. Why? Do um, so, so this is about really this spring is about Cameron. It's about Anquan and Bryson and, and a guy like Cam, you know, and I'm kind of fascinated to see, see what shakes out there because you can't, you can't put this kid out there and hand it to him 300 more times. I just don't know if that's realistic. Something, you know, that may spell doom for your offense. It may spell doom for Taj. It may, you know, it, it, we need to be more well-rounded is what I hear them saying. We've got to have three running backs and we need to utilize them. As painful as it may, it may seem like, you know, at times like Taj, come over here. This is not your series right now. We've got to, we've got to get somebody else in there who that someone or someone's are is being determined. I think is these, practices roll along there but uh, yeah you get a good glimpse of behind the scenes of some of the depth there <clears throat> pardon me and i may put a little more stock honestly in the best way to help taj brooks or the most likely way to help taj brooks not actually being with running back depth because i'm very skeptical of how that's going to turn out this season but maybe it's coming via your quarterback and your group of receivers being a little bit more reliable a little bit more consistent uh, a little more dynamic as we've talked about. I mean, there's a great way to spell a running back uh, also. Chuck it down the field and take it to the house. Everybody go get a water break now while we watch the defense. So I don't know. If I was a gambling man and you said, all right, what's actually going to help Taj Brooks this year? What are you betting on? Running back depth or maybe a better passing game uh, to spell some of that? I I might go passing game, to be honest with you. I prefer both. I will I will have both. And you said, <laughs> we, you said we can't hand it to him another 300 times. I'd like to add – we can try, however. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, no. let's try it till it doesn't work, I suppose. It's crazy to think about that number. And then through the first two weeks of the season, I, what did he total? Like 20 carries through two games or 14? Yeah. It's crazy. The yeah, and it, and it was 290 to be exact. And that includes yeah. the bowl game and all that stuff. But but it's just – and again, he handled it fine. And, and I don't want to sit here and tell you that he couldn't physically do it again. But I, I just think you're, you're – you're, that's a huge gamble. You're and playing with fire. It, and it's not best for the young man, I don't think. Um, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of like uh, taking a starting pitcher and saying, you know what, you, you've got the, you've got a rubber arm. I'm going to throw you 120 <laughs> every start. And you know what? I think you can handle it. You're fine. Sure, coach, yeah. I, I'm good. Well, at some point, it's just like you get uh, diminishing returns there. Yeah. And 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 I think you're 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 hurting yourself. Because what happens next year? You've got to develop some something else here and some experience. So when he does exhaust his eligibility, whenever he plays his last game this year, th there there's some things we can fall back on too. You know what I mean? So, but I, I'm just again, it's yeah. a it's a it's not a storyline that maybe a lot of people are thinking about because you maybe have one of your best players and one of your first team all conference guys at that spot. It's just like what else is there? And I think yep. that's a huge question mark. And I would like to not even think at this time about the future beyond Taj Brooks because that gets even a little scarier. But maybe we come up with some things this year that will uh, be encouraging about that future whenever that time does come. Chris, appreciate the time as always, man. Enjoyed it all week long. And we'll be back on the other side of the weekend to kick off a brand new week. Back into football. We'll get back into some of those thoughts from Brett Yormark we wanted to chew on from a very interesting conversation from uh, Big 12 Pro Day as well. So looking forward to it, man. We'll see you then. Sounds good. Hope everybody has a, a good weekend. Happy Easter, everybody. We'll talk to everybody uh, as next week begins. Enjoy the rest of the madness. If you're still uh, intrigued there, Red Raiders uh, in Central Florida trying to play uh, some baseball and football practice continues. So There you uh, go. Yeah, there you go. A whole lot to chew on. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you're never missing any of the chewing of the cud here on Locked on Texas Tech. Thanks for being out there, and we hope to see you back 
for the next round on Locked On Texas Tech.